very excited to have Petra Kodinsky with us. Petra has a very distinguished career, many achievements as a journalist. He's been an author, broadcaster, uh, but perhaps in my view, maybe his most important legacy may be this a translation of the book of Shochanko's uh, Kobzar. Uh, it's from Peter, I have learned so much more about the many facets of Taras Shochanko, of his character and his person. And uh, this is a uh, part of the session today is to explore what we find in Shochanko's poetry, his paintings or sketches, uh, and also, as we said, the women in his life. So without uh, further ado, it is my pleasure to turn the podium over to Petra, Peter. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, this is a subject uh, I've long wanted to do uh, talk about. It's an important subject. As I told you, when you called me to uh, ask uh, if I could do it, I said that the Kobzar is written in a feminine key, although there's a... <laughs> There's a lot of masculinity there as well, but uh, the feminine part is very, very important. And I'd just like to say a, a word about how it uh, uh, came to the translation. Uh, it began when I first got to Moscow, and I give credit to Volodymyr Minnichanko, who wrote a terrific uh, biography of Shevchenko called uh, Taras Shevchenko, My so Sojourn in Moscow. Uh, Minnichenko was the head of the uh, Ukrainian Cultural Institute in Moscow. And he wrote a human biography that uh, allowed me to retrace Shevchenko's steps in Moscow, where he had tea, where he purchased his art supplies, uh, who he saw. And uh, I saw him as a, as a human being. So that during the, uh, the three, year, uh, three plus years that I was there, uh, that was always in my mind. And um, I'd like to also note that uh, um, in my introduction, I say that um, there's a difference between the aesthetics and the content of any translation. Uh, and it's extremely difficult to translate aesthetics. So, so I focused on content and I hope I, I did a good job because uh, Shevchenko's original is sublime. There's no substitute for that. And the late 19th and early 20th century Ukrainian poet Ivan Franko said this about Shevchenko's portrayal of women. I don't know of any poet in world literature who so consistently, passionately, and consciously stands as a champion of women's rights. In Shevchenko's prose and poetry collection, the Kobzar, the name Katerina figures prominently. The name is sometimes used by Ukrainian writers to illustrate the ideals and hardships of life in Ukraine. His mother and oldest sister were also named Katerina. Taras's mother died when he was nine and she was only 40, done in by the unrelenting toil of serfdom. He remembers her in a poem entitled, If You Gentlemen But Knew, about those who confuse the pretty superficial appearance of a Ukrainian village with actual life in it. There my mother swaddled me, singing as she swaddled, easing all her tedium through her little child. In that grove, within that hut, in paradise, I witnessed hell itself. Bondage, crushing labor, and they leave no time to pray. That's where poverty and drudgery sent my mother, still quite young, to an early grave. Katerina, Shevchenko's oldest sister, then became his nanny. He refers to her as my unforgettable sister, my patient, my tender nanny in a novella entitled The Princess. She took him on occasional mini pilgrimages to the relatively close by 11th century Motrin's Monastery, which is located in a forest called the Cold Ravine. Shevchenko later wrote a powerful poem by the same name in which the forest is the setting for a bloody historic uprising against serfdom in 1768. That was a few years before the first partition of Poland, which had controlled right bank Ukraine. Shevchenko turned his grandfather's eyewitness stories about the uprising into another poem, the epic Hydamax, which weaves the protagonist's struggle for Ukrainian freedom with an effort to free his girlfriend Oksana from captivity. 
After the partition, Russia gained control of Ukraine, excluding Galicia. Thus, a third significant Katerina came into Shevchenko's life before he was even born. It was the Russian Empress, known in English as Catherine the Great, whose greatness came at Ukraine's expense. She not only extended serfdom, she destroyed the Ukrainian military stronghold known as the Siege and subjected Ukrainians to the Russian military draft. Thus, Shevchenko depicts Ukrainian mothers, maidens, and widows as those who bear the pain of losing not only their fathers, sons, brothers, and husbands to foreign interests, but also as victims of violent foreign dominion over their very bodies. Rape. Their plight is a key underpinning of the Kobzar's central message of human liberty and dignity. Catherine appears in several verses, including an 1845 poem entitled The Blind Man, in which Shevchenko wrote that the Empress enslaved free people for degenerates and bastards, a reference to Catherine's own illegitimate son. Shevchenko was 28 when he painted this oil of a fictional Katerina, the tragic heroine of a poem he began writing at the end of 1838, the year a group of Ukrainian and Russian intellectuals bought his freedom. It's a cautionary tale of a village girl who falls in love with a handsome Russian officer. Fall in love, you dark-browed girls, but not with Muscovites, for Muscovites are strangers. They will do you wrong. A Muscovite loves jokingly, and jokingly he'll leave you. He'll return to Muscovy and leave the girl to perish. Ostracized by her parents and village, Katerina at first believes the officer's promise to marry when he returns from war. However, he abandons her and his infant son, leaving Katerina to her own devices in the dead of winter. Without a home or hope, she emerges barefoot from a forest by a frozen lake. Take my soul, dear God, and you, my body. Splash into the water. Beneath the ice a rumble spread. Dark-browed Katerina found what she was seeking. The wind blew across the pond. Not a trace was left. The poem ends when the father briefly reappears in a Berlin coach drawn by six horses, the Maybach or Rolls-Royce of its time. He recognizes his abandoned son by his hazel eyes and dark brows inherited from his mother, but leaves him in the dust along with the blind Kobzar, or itinerant musician, for whom the orphan boy grew up to serve as a bag boy. Another frequent name in the Kobzar is Oksana, reminiscent of his curly-haired childhood sweetheart, Oksana Kovalenko, whom he mentions several times in his poetry. In a verse written in 1850, when he was in exile in Orenburg, Russia, he says he only asked God for a single home within a grove beside a pair of poplars and for my luckless sweet Oksana, so we could both together watch the mighty Dnipro from a hill to watch the valleys, all the golden meadows and the soaring mounds. From the hill we'd then descend. Above the Dnipro in a shady grove, till twilight we would dance, till God's world would fall asleep, till the evening star would join the moon to rise above the hill, and a mist would shroud the meadow. We'd look, we'd pray, and conversing, we'd have supper in our tiny home. It was in such pastoral surroundings so dear to Taras that Oksana remained and married another man. She appears in a couple more poems, including Marianne the Nun, in which Shevchenko creates a composite of Ukrainian women who were charmed, used, and abandoned by foreign occupiers. That we, Oksana, wandered off with soldiers, then vanished. True, a year went by and she returned, but what of it? With a bastard she returned, unwed and shorn of hair. She sat at times beneath the fence, calling like a cuckoo, shouting sometimes, singing softly now and then, and undoing phantom braids. Again she disappeared, gone insane, and ruined. In the introduction to my translation, art scholar Lesya Generaluk 
notes that Shevchenko the artist frames light against darkness in his poetry with a refrain that we created hell in paradise. Thus, his dark depictions of reality are contrasted by luminescent meditations on beauty, hope, justice, and grace. These clearly reflect the influence of the Bible, which served him as a source of morality and inspiration throughout his life. He considered motherhood to be the most beautiful thing in life. In our paradise on earth, there's nothing nicer than a youthful mother with her little babe. She wakes at night to guard her treasure. She awaits the light to see her child again, to express her love in words. It's mine, mine. She gazes at the child, prays to God for it, and strolls along the street much prouder than the empress. But years go by. Amid serfdom and subjugation, the son leaves for the army, and the once proud mother is left alone, cold, tattered, and harassed by dogs. Shevchenko had two brothers, shown in this photo, and five sisters, three of whom were named Maria. The first died at two, the second was blind, and the third was a half-sister. He asked about the sightless sister in letters and sent money to her and his siblings. He once wrote to his brother Mikita to tell Sister Yarina's husband, an artist who drank and beat her, that if he doesn't get a grip, he'll end up in a place he never dreamed of. He wrote a poem for Yarina in which she appears in a dream. We then awoke, you in serfdom, I in bondage. Thus you and I were fated yet as children to dread a thorny field. Pray, my sister, if we live, God will help us cross. Taras's father died when he was eleven, and the orphan's owner, Pavel Engelhardt, took Taras from the village at the age of fifteen, first to Vilno, today's Vilnius, and then to St. Petersburg. Thanks to a Polish girlfriend he met during his eighteen months in Vilnius, Shevchenko realized his status as a slave. The girlfriend, Yadviga, or Dunya Usakowska, was also an orphan and lived with her aunt. While Shevchenko had to deal with the whims and wishes of his owner, Dunya was free to do what she wanted, whenever. Years later, Shevchenko told the artist Ivan Soshenko, who was instrumental in the poet's emancipation, that because of Dunya, I first arrived at the idea, why should we unfortunate serfs not be the same as people with free status. Taras appreciated the work of Poland's great poet Adam Mickiewicz. Command of Polish and three other languages gave Shevchenko a basis to counsel his fellow Ukrainians to learn, read, and study what is foreign, but don't forsake your own. In addition, his stay in Vilnius coincided with a Polish national uprising against Russian Tsarist rule. Shevchenko biographer Pavlo Zaitsev suggests that the national implications of the uprising would not have escaped his attention. In other words, if the Poles could fight for their freedom, why not Ukrainians? Sofia Engelhardt, the wife of Taras's selfish owner, gave Shevchenko access to the family library, allowed him to study French with a governess, arranged formal art training for him, and through her piano playing, introduced him to the music of Beethoven. Russian composer Mikhail Glinka was Sofia's distant relative and played piano in the Engelhard home. Shevchenko, as the family's boy's servant, listened and learned from the sideline of high society. In novellas he would write later in life, he mentions his fondness for Beethoven, Haydn, Rossini, Karl Maria von Weber, Mozart, and virtuosos of his day, including violinists Henri Vuitton and Ludwig Spohr, as well as cellists Bernhard Romberg and Adrien Francois Servet, whose concert Shevchenko attended in St. Petersburg. He was similarly erudite in art, sculpture, literature, and current affairs. But what if ignorance is bliss for a slave? He suggests the question in a poem called The Branded Khan, about a serf and outcast who was taught to read and write 
but his fiancée was raped and impregnated on their wedding day by the son of the lady who taught him to read. He laments knowing what he knew in a poem called My Thirteenth Year, in which he recalls his childhood sweetheart, Oksana Kovalenko. A girl not far sorting hemp beside the road heard that I was crying. She came, greeted, wiped my tears, and kissed me. It seems the sun beamed once again. It seems all on earth became my own. Fields, forests, and the orchards. And we, both joking, drove a stranger's lambs to water. Nonsense. Even now, when I recall, the heart cries and aches over why the Lord did not let me live my years out as a youngster in that lovely paradise. Mm -hmm. I'd have died behind a field plow, knowing nothing of this world. I'd not be an outcast in that world, cursing man and God. Shevchenko came by this knowledge by virtue of his voracious appetite for reading and good fortune to have had his God-given talent as an artist recognized by a group of Ukrainian and Russian intellectuals. They purchased his freedom when he was 24 for the hefty sum of 2,500 rubles, an amount that an ordinary person could comfortably live on for as much as eight years. Shevchenko's intellect was matched by Barbara Repnina, a descendant of the last hetman, or military leader, of left-bank Ukraine, Kirillo Rozumovsky. She loved Taras and probably would have married him. Shevchenko met Repnina at her father's estate in Ukraine, and though he enjoyed Repnina's company and dedicated his Byronesque poem The Funeral Feast to her, he did not reciprocate her love. Nonetheless, Repnina promoted his artistic career and corresponded with the poet when he was exiled in 1847 until authorities prohibited such contact three years later. When they met again in Moscow after Taras's release from exile in 1857, both had aged, Taras in particular. The old relationship was not rekindled. Another intellectual equal was Ukrainian writer Maria Velinska, whose pen name was Marko Vochok. Shevchenko was impressed with her work. Much of it focused on social justice for serfs and women. She also translated French science fiction writer Jules Verne into Russian. Shevchenko met Vochok in St. Petersburg in 1859 and dedicated a poem to her in which a serf dozes off in a field and dreams of freedom for her infant son. Alas, she awakes. The wretch then smiled, awoke, there's nothing. She glanced quickly at her son, took him, swaddled him again, and to keep at bay the overseer, she went to reap another three score sheaves. In another poem, also entitled Dream, written 15 years earlier, Shevchenko soars over Russia, describing human injustice amid the beauty he sees below. Included was a line that said, Tsar Nicholas's wife had a wobbly head. In his book, Empire of the Tsar, the French Marquis de Coustin wrote that a nervous convulsion caused the Empress's head to slightly shake. Shevchenko may have had access to the book. An English republication was edited by former First Lady Jackie Kennedy Onassis in 1989. But in 1847, Tsar Nicholas was not pleased. The dream resulted in Shevchenko's 10-year exile as a soldier. He was first sent more than 1,600 miles southeast of St. Petersburg to Orenburg under personal orders from the Tsar not to write or paint. Taras initially ignored the order, writing several poems and painting, among others, this portrait of fellow Ukrainian Mykola Isayev. The young officer was having an adulterous affair with the wife of a quartermaster with whom Taras shared this house in Orenburg. Shevchenko felt obligated to tell his friend about the betrayal. Isayev retaliated by informing authorities that the poet had violated the Tsar's prohibition. So Shevchenko ended up still deeper in exile, spending seven lonely years at the desolate Novopetrovsk fortress 
on the eastern shore of the Caspian Sea in today's Kazakhstan. It was a hellhole with a high mortality rate among soldiers who generally spent only two years there. He was, however, good friends with the family of the fort commander. Amid the desolation, Shevchenko and the commander's wife, Agata Uskova, enjoyed one another's company. She wrote, We never talked about matters of his heart. Shevchenko often danced with me. I was glad to have such a good conversationalist. Discussions with him were always far from local gossip and gave me much satisfaction. After exile, Taras seemed nearly desperate for marriage. About four months before he died at the age of 47, he wrote in a poem that, despite so many people in the world, I'll come to die alone in a cold lopsided house or beneath a fence somewhere. Or, no, I must get married, if even with the devil's sister, for I'll go mad of loneliness. Late in life, Taras had placed his hopes for marriage with a 16-year-old actress in Nizhny Novgorod, Katerina Pionova. Her parents did not approve. A former Ukrainian serf, Likera Polosmak, was briefly engaged to Taras in St. Petersburg. He wrote a love poem for her, and when the relationship failed, he wrote another. I'll be resting in the garden all alone and lonely. I'll dream of little children, of a happy mother, and a vivid dream from long ago will come to me again. And you? No, I will not rest, for you'll be in the dream. And quietly, by stealth, you'll sneak into my little Eden. You'll wreak havoc. You'll set my lonely paradise afire. Lakera married a barber. After his death in 1904, she moved to Kaniv, where Shevchenko is buried, overlooking the Dnipro River, and frequently visited his grave. A brief break now with portraits Shevchenko created of women. The clip is accompanied by soprano Joan Sutherland singing Non mi dir bel idol mio from Mozart's opera Don Giovanni. Shevchenko heard orchestral excerpts from it during a play he attended in St. Petersburg on October 1st, 1857.
This last slide is Shevchenko's portrait of his fiancée, Lakara Polusmak. And again, soprano Joan Sutherland performed the aria Non mi dir bel idol mio from Mozart's opera Don Giovanni. Composite and fictitious women populate the Kobzar from the first poem to the last. In the first one, Mad Maiden, a young orphan is driven insane because it had been years since her lover was sent to war. The narrator sympathizes with her. The fortunate lovebird flies high in the sky, taking wing to the Lord to ask of her sweetheart. But whom can the orphan petition? Who will respond, and who is to know where her sweetheart now quarters? In a dark distant forest? Or the swift moving Danube, where he waters his horse? Loves he another, and has he forgotten the dark brow he loved? If only she had the wings of an eagle, she'd find her sweet darling beyond the blue sea. He'd live for her love, and she'd strangle the other, and should he be dead, she'd join him in death. Shevchenko crisscrossed Ukraine for three years as a member of an imperial archaeological mission when he was 29. It was his first visit since he left as a serf, leaving him appalled at the squalor and injustice he witnessed. In a poem entitled The Plundered Mound, he depicts Ukraine as a loving and nurturing mother. But she condemns her son, 17th century Ukrainian leader Bohdan Khmelnytsky, for a deal he made with Russia that ended up costing Ukraine her liberty. Placid earth, O oh my dear land, O oh my dear Ukraine, why have you been plundered? What is it, Mama, that you're dying for? Did you not pray to God before the break of dawn? Did you not teach tradition to your young, uncertain children? I prayed, I worried, day and night I did not rest, caring for my little children and teaching them our customs. My blossoms, my good children grew. I too once reigned upon this world. I reigned. O oh, Bohdan, you foolish son, look now upon your mother, upon your dear Ukraine, who sang of her misfortune as she rocked you in the cradle, who awaited freedom as she sang and cried. O oh, Bohdan, my dear Bohdan, had I known, I'd have choked you in the cradle, closed your eyes beside my heart. Shevchenko frames nature, fame, fortune, and his creative muse as women. Here's a poem about the change of seasons. Oak forest, shady grove, thrice yearly you are clad. You have yourself a wealthy father. He first ramps you in a lavish gown of green. He marvels to himself at his shady grove. Gazing at his daughter, so very dear and young, he takes her and envelops her in a cloak of gold, then proceeds to wrap her in a veil of white. He then lays himself to sleep, weary from his worries. Now an excerpt from a tongue-in-cheek poem entitled Fame. The poem's robber at Versailles refers to Emperor Napoleon III, who replaced the Second French Republic with authoritarian rule. And you, floozy, barmaid, drunken harlot, where was it that you tarried with a tyrant and your charms? Did you hand them out on credit to the robber at Versailles? Did you entice another when you were bored and tipsy? Just snuggle up to me, we'll make the best of it, and oh so nicely we'll embrace. Then, my gorgeous lady, we'll quietly exchange a joke, a peck, and we'll marry one another, because I still swagger after you. Shevchenko drawings that predated his freedom hearkened to tyranny in ancient Rome that led to the deaths of Virginia and Lucretia, the subjects of much classical art. Characters in his poetry protect women. The hero in the next excerpt from Should It So Happen risks his own well-being to help a defenseless victim of rape. The wretched girl screams. The boys run to her, but do not help because they fear the Lord. But one, the youngest, looked around and pierced the lordling with a pitchfork as if he were a frog. 
The scoundrel groaned and croaked. They discussed, sending word of it to town. The court converged, they looked. Then the judges all got good and drunk. They bound the youngster, locked him up, and that was that. Actually, the story continues with a semi-happy ending. Widows are among the most poignant figures in the Kobzar. They take care that their sons succeed in life and marriage and count on their help in old age. This widow places hope in her infant son. You'll be grown, my son, in five and two score years, living like a prince's child, tall and slender as an ash tree, limber, robust, well-off, happy, and not single. I'll find your equal beyond the azure sea if needed. She may be a merchant's daughter, she may be a captain's, but she'll be a lady, son. In an overcoat of green, dressed in bright red shoes, she'll strut proudly like a peacock all around the parlor, and when she talks to you, your home will be like paradise, and I'll be sitting in a comfy corner just watching both of you. But, the Tsarist army had different plans for the widow's pride and joy. Since draft in Tsarist Russia meant 25 years of military service, the mother would never see her boy again. It's a tearjerker. The poem Naimichka, or The Hireling, caught the attention of 20th century Ukrainian literary illustrator Sofia Karafa Korbut. The verse is about an unwed mother powerless to raise her son. She abandons her baby with a loving but elderly childless couple. One day, a young woman offers them her services as a nanny, and the old folks take her in. Around the child she stoops as if she were its mother. On weekdays and on Sundays, she'll wash his little head and dress him in a clean white shirt. Each and every day she plays, she sings, makes him little toys, and on holidays won't let him from her arms. My oldsters are amazed and pray to God above. You can pretty much guess who the hireling turns out to be, but the poem's tenderness makes it one of Shevchenko's classics. The first person to translate the poem into Russian, Oleksiy Plashcheyev, wrote about it to novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky. I don't know how the translation came out, but the original is a wonderfully poetic thing. It's hard to translate. It's simple, natural, and straight from the heart. Incredibly so. In a poem entitled The Poplar, a young woman wishes she had known in advance that her lover would die in war, so she could have stopped him from going, or herself from loving him. But the poet says, people cannot gainsay love. This too is a curse to know ahead what waits for you on earth. Best not to know, dear girls. Do not ask about your fate. The heart alone knows whom to love. A princess beloved by serfs in a poem entitled The Princess is subjected to incest by her drunken and uncaring father. The scene recalls the sensational 16th century case of Beatrice Cenci, who killed the father who raped her, but Pope Clement VIII rejected clemency requests and she was executed despite mitigating circumstances. Confiscated Chenchi property was passed to the Pope's family. Where to, filthy viper? What's your purpose? He takes no pause but grabs a key. He comes, unlocks the door, and crawls in with his daughter. Awake! Awake, O purest one! Take hold! Kill the viper, or he'll bite! Kill, and God will not condemn, like Chenchi, who had killed the cardinal, her father, and had no fear of Sabioth. Another father's attempt to arrange a marriage for his daughter results in two axe murders in the poem The Famous Town of Vilna. At issue is mixed marriage. The father is Jewish. The daughter loves a Lithuanian. Indications are the poem was based on a true story. In any case, Shevchenko always sided with a girl's heart, not her parents. Shevchenko's depictions of violence in the Kobzar are as unflinching as his portraits of beauty and hope are enduring. Thus, his empathetic and tender portrayal of women 
is contrasted with the reality that some are deceptive or envious. The Drowned Maiden involves a beautiful widow who sleeps around with Kozaks, but gets pregnant with a girl who grows into a kind and loving beauty, whom the Kozaks like more than the aging mother. When poison doesn't kill the daughter, the mother drowns her in an envious rage. Of the many types of trees in the Kobzar, the poplar appears most frequently. In a poem about romantic retribution, God placed two of the trees atop a burial mound. Earlier, they were sisters, each smitten with the same Kozak, who secretly courted both until they found out. So that's the way you are, you bully. You're heartless to us sisters. And they went to find some toxic herbs to poison Ivan in the morning. They found the herbs, dug them up, and then began to cook. They cried, they wept, but there's no denying the cooking is a must. Their plan simultaneously succeeds in boomerangs. The theme is reminiscent of the classic Ukrainian song Oyne Khude Ritsu, a Shevchenko favorite attributed to 17th century Ukrainian songstress Marusia Churai. The poet would recognize the melody used in the 1941 American hit song Yes, My Darling Daughter, performed by Edie Gourmet. Herbs play a role in both versions of The Witch, poems in which the main character learns the healing arts in an odyssey with her owner. These are poems in which an overlord misuses the girl who bears twins, a boy and a girl. In the first version, the lord swaps the daughter for a greyhound and loses the son in a game of cards. In the second, the lord leaves the daughter in Muscovy and the son is handed to the army because he had no respect for lords. Despite the pain the overlord inflicted on the woman, she is not embittered. She gathered herbs and went to treat him in the mansion, to help and not to curse. She did not help the sick man because they did not let her. When he died, she prayed to God for him. She lived a saintly life, teaching girls not to love the lords and not to shun the people. Thus she taught and healed the sick and with the poor she shared the only crumbs she had. People good and wise knew her very well, but they called her nonetheless an unwed mother and a witch. Shevchenko had a playful side, too. He penned lively and lyrical poems such as The Girl Who Loves Three Men and Can't Make Up Her Mind About Which to Marry, A Miller, A Sandler, or A Cooper. I roamed the thicket, gathering nuts, and just for fun I fell in love, and for the miller I went nuts. The miller mills and winnows. He turns around, and just for fun he lays a kiss on me. A saddler and cooper also embrace the girl who shares her plan with Mom. If you really want to know, my mother, whom you'll call your son-in-law, each and every one, my mother, each of them come Sunday, you will call your son. Shevchenko enjoyed freedom for only 13 of his 47 years. Time lost in bondage made him rusty as an artist. He never got to be called a son-in-law, nor did he live in a tiny house, though he drew up these plans for one overlooking the Dnipro and authorized a cousin to buy land for which he had money from royalties. But rich landowners did not want the people's poet as a neighbor. The love Shevchenko was denied in life is requited in part with the enduring love all Ukrainians have for him. Composers who put Shevchenko to music, artists who illustrated his poetry, even astronomers who named heavenly objects for him, and communities that erected nearly 1,400 statues to the poet in Ukraine and around the world said in unison that he was a great man who sacrificed his freedom so his fellow Ukrainians may live in peace free of foreign and domestic oppression. This presentation offered but a brief outline of the Kobzar's rich portrayal of women and of life. Omitted were a willow tree eavesdropping on a couple in love, spinsters who lament their fate or are encouraged to go astray, a woman who rocks a bloody dagger like a baby, or another who cradles a brick in lieu of a baby, a woman who asks the wind to find her lover lost at sea, 
a young barefoot beer waitress, an innocent, undefiled teen, a widow begging alone in winter, a loving wife of a blind man, the stepdaughter of a lecher, the pagan mother of a Christian killed in the Roman Colosseum, nuns, Bathsheba, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and more. Their hopes, fears, strengths, and weaknesses are complemented by those of men in settings of natural beauty from the Holy Land across Ukraine to the Orient. I wish I could share all of it with you and hope my translation will help readers get acquainted with his poems. They are alternately frightening, funny, despairing, hopeful, sacred, sacrilegious, and always illuminating and entertaining.